year 2012, months after I had finally decided to get a passport, I got an email from a friend. I was very surprised by the content inviting me to apply for an international Antarctic expedition. My first reaction was to leave it uh, in the folder without doing anything about it for days. But finally, I reread it a couple of times, and after months of dithering, I decided to go ahead and apply. I was selected, and about six months later, in February 2013, I went on my first trip abroad, destination Antarctica. Antarctica is unlike any other continent. It is the windiest, driest, the highest, most remote continent on Earth. And the time to get there is very limited. The window is open only for about four months because the rest of the time, the seas around Antarctica are frozen. Not many people get to go there. And it's such a privilege to be able to share these experiences with you. Like most people, I was excited about seeing the penguins. Being a birder, I always look forward to seeing birds of any shape and size and color. Our first instruction were to remain at least five feet away from any kind of wildlife. Once we got there, we were running around to make sure we maintained it because the curious penguins were coming right up to us. They're biting at our boots. They're trying to take off the shoelaces. Uh, but what struck me were these bones that are lying scattered around the beaches of Antarctica. This was really my first lesson. I was skeptical about the kind of impact that human beings could make on a continent so remote. But once we got there and saw those bones, the remains of a time when whaling almost took out the entire continent, when whalers went and killed all the animals there for food, for, for the blubber to light up the lands. And if it were not for the discovery of electricity, perhaps that continent would have been lost to us. However, when we got there, we got a lesson that no place on Earth is too remote to be impacted by human development activities. No experience sharing of the last great wilderness will be complete without sharing the experience of camping there. And this was the most incredible uh, beginning because we decided to camp under the skies in dugouts. Now believe me, it was extremely cold. In spite of all the mats we used, in spite of the sleeping bags below our backs, we were frozen stiff. We did not sleep any moment. We could not close our eyes out of the cold. It was painfully biting cold. But that was good for us because we were able to see something that very few people see. That is the aurora australis, the southern lights. And it was the most beautiful thing imaginable. Antarctica has so many lessons. For everybody, there is something to offer. On the 2nd of March, I was standing in solidarity with the Pacific Island warriors. Uh, the Pacific Island nations are probably the most vulnerable to climate change, to rising sea levels, and they are probably going to disappear with, with the rising sea levels. Ironically, from the melting of ice sheets across Antarctica and Greenland. And there I was on the 2nd of March, doing my first act of activism for Antarctica, standing in solidarity with the Pacific warriors. Back in 2002, not many people believed in climate change. When the Larsen B ice shelf started to crack, scientists believed it would take ages to actually break off. Something which was geologically stable for so long could not just break away. But they were so wrong. Within weeks of discovery of the cracks, the Larsen B ice shelf had broken away. That was the first real impact of a warming planet that we noticed. 
Eleven years later, this huge iceberg, this tabular piece of ice was floating around in an area called the Antarctic Sound. And we were pulled out from our beds at 5.30 in the morning in the biting cold of Antarctica to see this. And the leader of our expedition, Robert Swan, who incidentally is the first man to have walked to both the, pla to the poles, both the poles, he pointed out and said, take this picture home with you because this is the future we are creating for ourselves. If the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland were to melt, sea level rise would be over 200 feet. That will wipe away many of our cities, many low-lying areas like Bangladesh, for example, and that will create a lot of difficulties for all of us. Now, the best part of going on such an expedition is that you get to have a real cold bath, right? The polar plunge, and I was lucky to have done it twice at both ends of the earth. The first time we did that in Antarctica, we are tied up with a harness so that if we were to knock out cold from the numb, uh, the, but the shock of the cold water, we could be pulled out. It's not something that I'm going to do again, but two years back, I ended up going on another expedition. This was right to the edge of the sea ice where the National Geographic Explorer, our expedition ship, had to turn back because of the sea ice. And we are given the option of doing that again. And that was like 82 degree north. I thought I'm never going to get the opportunity to take bath in, you know, so far away again. So this time I, did to, I decided to do it again. And this time there was no harness. And I am somebody who is terrified of the depth, depths of water. I just jumped in and I just kept on sinking and there was no rope to pull me out. But thankfully, the buoyancy of the water, the Arctic Ocean, pushed me up and I came out to share these experiences with you. Uh, it is, nobody can pose for the camera down there. You have to be uh, making those funny faces. The North Polar region is home to some of the most incredible animals. The walrus, the polar bear, these are the iconic animals of the planet. The polar bear is my favorite. And these are unfortunately losing out as the warming takes away, reduces the sea ice, because they are so much dependent on the sea ice. The walrus is losing its habitat. We, we know it's shrinking every year. And scientists say both the polar bear and the walrus may disappear from the face of this planet within the turn of the century. That will be a sad day after having existed for millennia. But now, within about two 200 years of the Arctic exploitation by humans, they are on the verge of disappearance. I have had very close encounters with the polar bear. This happens to be my favorite animal, so I'm going to share a bit about that. Each picture here tells a story, and these are from the polar bear capital of the world, Churchill, in the north of Canada. And this is from 2015. On the top right, you see a polar bear by the railway tracks. And this was about 10 minutes after I ended up in that city. I just got out of the train, and we boarded a bus. And this was the first wildlife I saw. I was very excited, but this was not going to be the last. We saw many of them. At the bottom, you see the big fat polar bear. This is how they are supposed to look. They are supposed to eat a lot, fatten up for the winter, and then they are healthy and happy. But around the Arctic habitat, the polar bears are becoming more and more. Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult for them to survive because. The sea ice is breaking up faster. There is no seals to hunt anymore. Uh, the window of opportunistic hunting is decreasing. So they are wandering into cities, the towns that exist in the polar region. And one of them is Churchill. So this picture on the right, the polar bear holding facility, kind of summarizes the human colonialization of nature. How much humans have controlled wildlife? Can you imagine this is the polar bear jail 
We go to the polar bear habitat, to their home in the Arctic, and build a jail for bears which wander into town searching for food. This is symbolic of human exploitation of this planet, more than any other image I have come across. At the Churchill Northern Studies Center, we could observe the aurora borealis almost every day. But we did a lot of work, uh, although sometimes it used to be disrupted by polar bear appearances. We took part in a lot of studies concerning permafrost melting, the degradation of the Arctic ecosystems, the mesochasm, which is a long-term study to look at how the Arctic ecosystems are being de deprived of the nutrients in the wetlands that is vital to the few species of frogs and fishes that survive there. And concurrently, the birds that survive in the Arctic are also losing out because their food is decreasing. The polar regions are the air conditioners of our planet. There are so many kinds of ways what happens in the polar regions affect us. There's a saying, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects us all. There are so many ways. The loss of the Arctic sea ice could actually disrupt the Indian monsoon, the South Asian monsoon. There are studies which prove that. The loss of ice in the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet could drown a lot of low-lying countries like Bangladesh, for example, and we know what will happen. We cannot possibly close the borders to millions of refugees displaced by rising seawater levels. Our future is connected to what happens in the Arctic. I'm going to leave you with this iconic picture called the Blue Marble. This was clicked from the last Apollo mission, and this is related in a huge way to the launch of the modern environmental movement. But that's a story for another day. Thank you very much.